Thanks very much for uh, taking the time to complete that poll. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar today. So uh, hello and welcome to today's webinar, Your Brain on Leadership, part one of two. Thanks very much for joining us today on what's sure to be a fascinating topic. Uh, Dr. McCusker, who will be presenting, gave me a brief overview uh, of neuroleadership a few weeks ago and blew my mind. So it's going to be a very, very interesting topic. Uh, but we're going to start off with some housekeeping. Full disclosure, this session is being recorded. The archive of this recording will be available within 24 hours. If you signed up for this webinar through the UCI Extension Free Events website, you will automatically receive an email link to the recording once it's posted. And again, that usually happens in about 24 hours. If for some reason you don't receive that link tomorrow, you can always email me or access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com. Uh, click on the Event Center tab and then select View Event Recordings. There are, will be a lot of webinars listed, but just look for the title of this webinar, Your Brain on Leadership, and you will definitely find it. So my name is Daniel Powers. And I'm the program representative for the Human Resources Management uh, and Business Administration Certificate Programs, among others, here at UC Irvine Extension. Uh, today I'm speaking on behalf of the program director, Angela Jante. Uh, here's a brief overview of what we will be covering in today's webinar session. First, I'll be giving a brief overview of the features of WebEx so that you'll know how to submit questions throughout the discussion. Next, I'll give you some information about the Human Resource Management Certificate Program, including an overview of upcoming course offerings for the winter 2014 quarter. Uh, then we'll begin today's presentation with the uh, special guest presenter, Dr. Jennifer McCusker. Uh, then we'll have a brief uh, Q&A session, time permitting, and we'll wrap up by uh, reiterating our contact information if you have any questions that uh, we did not address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during this webinar, please send a chat message to UCI Robert, and he will help you to troubleshoot any issues. Uh, if you have a question for the panelists, please submit it in either the Q&A box or the chat panel, and we will address your question at the end of the session uh, if we have time. Uh, the chat panel should show up on the right side of your screen. When you send a chat question, make sure that you send it to both the host and the panelist to ensure that I, as well as Dr. McCusker, can see your question. Uh, you can also submit your question into the Q&A panel as shown on this handy slide. So here's a brief overview of the Human Resource Management Certificate Program. Uh, the program is highly regarded by local employers for its real-world focus, immediate applicability in the workplace, and most up-to-date information on domestic and international HR practices. The program will help you to increase your knowledge of staffing, compensation, employer relations, recruitment, organizational development, training, benefits, and much, much more. It will also expand your awareness and knowledge of government regulations and teach you to successfully integrate new technologies into your HR function. Our program is designed for a number of different audiences. Uh, currently, we have HR managers, assistants, trainers, recruiters, and staffing specialists as students in the program. Uh, it's also perfect for managers looking to better understand their human capital, as well as those interested in a career change into uh, the field of HR. Uh, the certificate program consists of six required courses uh, and two elective courses, so eight total classes entailing a minimum of 250 hours of instruction. Uh, students must complete all courses with a grade of C or better, as well as uh, complete a candidacy application form. It's recommended that you take either two or three classes in the program before applying for candidacy to make sure that the full program is one that you want to fully commit to. As previously mentioned, the certificate program consists of eight courses. The six required classes are listed here, uh, Foundations of HR, Leading Successful Organizational Change, Identifying, Recruiting, and Retaining Top Talent, Compensation, Training in Human Resource Development, and Human Resources and the Law. All of these classes will be available in the winter 2014 term in either the online or on-campus format here in sunny Irvine. Uh, we do recommend that individuals that are new to HR uh, begin 
with the introductory or uh, the foundations of HR class. Uh, but we are flexible, and many people do choose to take a course that is of greatest immediate interest of them. So if you want to do that, please give me a call. We also have some elective classes coming up uh, for winter 2014, Essentials of Management, Dealing Tactfully with Difficult People, and Business Writing. Uh, each course fee varies by the number of units and whether the course is to be held on campus or online. Uh, the core classes held online are $610. Uh, some courses do require a textbook, and that information uh, is on the course materials page, uh, on the course enrollment page on our, on our website. There's also a one-time candidacy application fee of $125. Uh, each course is paid for individually when you do enroll, and again, you don't have to apply for candidacy until you're ready to commit to the entire program. Uh, so registration for the winter 2014 term will begin on November 1st, uh, just about uh, three weeks or so. You can see the course details and register for the classes at that time. Uh, you can also check out our full brochure for the Human Resources Management Program online at the UC Irvine Extension website as it is posted on this slide. Uh, similar to the website, the brochure offers information about the program as well as course descriptions and other useful information. Uh, when it comes time to enroll, you can do so on our website or by calling our Student Services Office at 949-824-5414. And likewise, if you have any questions about financial aid, class locations, UC Irvine policies, or if you just want to talk, they'll be happy to chat with you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the presentation off uh, with Dr. Jennifer McCusker. And uh, she will take it from here for Your Brain on Leadership, Part 1. Great. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be sharing Part 1 of Your Brain on Leadership and this very interesting and emerging topic with all of you. Um, just to give you a quick background, um, I am a UCI alumni from undergrad, went on and got a uh, master's and PhD in organizational psychology and have been working for the past um, 15 years in the field of organizational uh, development. I got introduced to the concept of neuroleadership about six or seven years ago, um, and this field is probably only about eight or nine, maybe ten years old. So I feel very fortunate. I got in on the um, very early stages of it, and basically what's happening is the field of neuroscience and the field of leadership are coming together to really influence one another's work. Um, so I'm happy to share with you a little bit about that today, um, just sort of an introductory overview that to, you know, whet your appetite, and uh, there's much more research out there. So... This is part one of two parts, and what we're going to cover over the two sessions is what is neuroleadership, what is SCARF, SCARF is an acronym that we'll cover today, uh, the connection between neuroleadership and motivation, learning, and communication. So we'll talk about neuroleadership in many different forms over the two sessions. And then also, what does this mean for organizations? What does it mean for leaders? What does it mean for teams? Um, how do you integrate this into your organization? One thing I do want to note that's uh, very, very important is this is not my research. Um, I am pulling this research from the work of many researchers, uh, notably David Rock, Naomi Eisenberger, and Matthew Lieberman, although there's um, hundreds of people that are researching uh, the area of neuroleadership at this time in multiple different uh, facets. So. Uh, for more re for more on this, I would um, draw you know encourage you to look at neuroleadership.org. Uh, they have a website that has lots of research on it, as well as um, a couple of these really established researchers. So what I want to do first is um, let each of you raise your IQ for the remainder of this session, and so. Just to give you an idea of how much our brains are processing, we're actually processing about 10,000 sensory inputs at any given time. So we think about all the things that all the different things our brain is 
uh, taking in in terms of the temperature in the room and whether we're hungry or thirsty and the glare on the screen and every different color that it can see and all its perfer peripheral vision and the feeling of your feet and you know all those kinds of things. Your brain is processing all of these different sensory inputs. So over 10,000 at any given time, but we're only conscious of about 40 of them. So we actually have very little control over the many connections that are occurring each second, including the thousands of thoughts that go through our brain each day and are suddenly brought into consciousness. So you can think that you're, you're paying attention to something and all of a sudden um, a thought comes into your mind about something you have to do that weekend or don't forget to do this on the way home, right? You didn't ask for that thought to come in. It just came into consciousness out of nowhere. We have very little control over, over those stream of consciousness thoughts. Um, so one thing to do in order to help raise our IQ is to really remove external stimuli, re reduce the distractions. So in a typical meeting, um, if I was doing this in a meeting setting, I would say to turn off your cell phone. Not silence your cell phone, not on vibrate, but actually all the way off. The difference is because when it's on silent or on vibrate, it still has you're still monitoring. You're still able to monitor the red light that's blinking or the sound of the vibration or something like that. So your brain is still allocating energy to monitor that device. Um, but sitting in front of your computer, it might be your cell phone. It might be the pop-ups for an email warning. It might be, you know, putting your phone on do not disturb. There could be a lot of other things, um, closing your door, a lot of other things, not multitasking, um, that are inhibiting and causing our brain to take some precious resource. In fact, um, being on all the time, so connected to others via technology, can actually drop our IQ as much as an, losing an entire night's sleep, which is pretty profound. Um, just to note, one uh, difference in gender, this IQ increase is actually more pronounced in men than women. I'm not sure what that... Um, tells us, but maybe women have gotten a little bit better at monitoring multiple stimulus. So neuroleadership. As I said, the field of neuroscience and the field of leadership have come together to really influence one another. So in the past, there's been a lot of theories about leadership and what causes people to do things and you know, why people behave the way they behave and what are the right ways to influence and um, gain followership and all these different things. There's hundreds and thousands and thousands of books written on the topic of leadership. Uh, what we haven't known, though, is the exact answers. There's a lot of theories, but we don't know exactly with precision if any of them are, are right. And yet now we have this advancement in the field of neuroscience. So what's happened is the MRI machine advanced now be the fMRI machine, which is the functional MRI machine, and it allows us to, to actually watch what's happening in the brain while it's happening, as opposed to just taking pictures of the brain. So what that has done is opened up a tremendous amount of, um, of ability for us to expand research and actually figure out what's driving people's behavior what parts of our brain are being allocated and what does that tell us about that. So in essence, we're really be, being able to harden up the soft stuff, the soft part of, uh, traditionally soft part of uh, the business world. So you can see there a definition of neuroleadership and it's really this emerging field of connecting um, neuroscience with leadership. One thing to note is there are more questions than there are answers still in this field. And so I'm giving you a very, very, very brief overview on just one sliver of, of research. There are, there's so much more for you to investigate and so much more out there um, still unknown. But the research is continuing and it's just very exciting how fast it's coming out. In terms of the field of neuroleadership, the um, governing body, if you will, this neuroleadership institute, really um, identifies with four areas of study. This is making decisions and, and um, solving problems, regulating emotions, collaborating with others, and facilitating change. So the research is really um, geared towards one, one or more of those four areas within leadership, which are all areas that, again, there's thousands of stuff written about, but we really don't have scientific answers for until now. So let me just give you a little bit of a uh, lesson on your brain, and some of you might be familiar with this and some of this uh, might be new to you. If 
If I get stung by a bee on my arm, the sensation will go up my arm and then up my spinal cord into my brain stem, into my brain. And by the nature of the way the brain is set up, when it goes up my brain stem into my brain, it's going to trigger the center of my brain before it gets to the front of my brain. What's significant about that is in the center of our brain is an area called the limbic system. And that's where it's, our amygdala lives, which is really our emotional hub, our mission control for regulating emotions for us. The front of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, is an area of the brain where you need uh, to be able to access in order to do things like move things into long-term memory, think creatively, have broader perspective, solve complex problems. It's not that all those things happen there. It's that you need to be able to leverage that part of your brain in order to do those things. Now, the reason these two parts of, our, uh, of the brain are so important to identify is that they actually have an inverse relationship. Um, so if something happens to me and it stimulates my um, amygdala, for example, I get stung by a bee and I feel that in the center of my brain, I'm gonna, it's going to alert. My amygdala is going to go on high alert and start you know, flashing, if you will. Um, and what that does is going to shut down my ability to access my prefrontal cortex. So if I get bad news, if um, someone isn't very nice, right, or, or, or you know, something great happens, whatever the emotion is, if our, if our emotional control goes off, we, we, we limit the ability uh, to access our prefrontal cortex. And this is going to make a lot more sense as we get further into this um, presentation. Now, the correlation between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex is a 0.89, which is an extremely high correlation. It's nearly a one-to-one -one correlation, which just which tells you how related those two parts of our brain are. Um, and our prefrontal cortex is only 2% of our brain, but it takes 20% of our brain's energy to access it. It's an energy hog. And so when we need to, we, we really need to be in a great, even state of mind to be able to do the things that most employees are trying to do every day at work, like think creatively and solve complex problems. So let's back up just a little bit. Um, most of you are probably familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Maslow proposed this theory in 1943 in a paper on human motivation. So this was a theory put out there around what motivates people. And as you probably know, um, the theory says that you're, you're uh, motivated to achieve things lower on this uh, pyramid before you have the motivation to get after the things higher on the pyramid. This makes complete sense from a face validity standpoint. However, through the research uh, that's being done in uh, neuroleadership, what we've actually found recently is that this model is incorrect, uh, that we actually don't place a difference in terms of what we're motivated to get after between physical and social needs. So one, um, one study that was done to demonstrate this was that it was called the triad experiment. And it was done in a study in, at UCLA by Naomi Eisenberger, who I uh, named earlier. And what she was looking for is how people respond to social pain. So the idea of being rejected or berated, right? So they put three people in a uh, machine, one in each machine, and I'm sorry, they put one person in a machine and told them there's two people in two other machines, just like them in two other rooms. Uh, there actually were not two people in other rooms, but you're led to believe that there are. So you're in a machine, and what you see is an outline of a character that represents you and um, a hand that represents your hand, and the game is to throw the, a ball in a triad and just continue to do that. And so you throw the ball, and then they throw it to the other person, and the person throws it back to you, and you're throwing in this triad or triangle um, until out of nowhere the other two start throwing it back and forth and leave you out, which is eliciting this feeling of being rejected. What happened is the exact same regions of the brain, five regions of the brain, lit up as in a study where people were inflicted with some sort of mild physical pain. So what that tells us is our brain responds to those things identically. 
In fact, they took it a step further and said, hey, if our brain responds to mild physical pain that way, then I wonder what would, or, or responds to mild physical pain in, in a way that Tylenol would help. Um, I wonder what would happen if we gave people who are experiencing social pain Tylenol. And in fact, the people that had the Tylenol versus the placebo and control group actually reported lower social pain or feeling of social pain than those who um, had a placebo. So it's really interesting to think about um, this in terms of how we describe social pain. So when you break up with someone, you describe it as my heart's aching, um, I'm hurting, right? And you use very physical terms to describe that. And so this is just one study that's demonstrating how our brain doesn't place a priority on physical or social pain or respond to, you, to those types of pain um, differently. In fact, we respond identically. So if our brain isn't organized in this hierarchy as Maslow had um, suggested, then how is it organized? In fact, it's, it's organized into threat and reward. So threat meaning that you are you want less of that. You want to move away from that situation or that person. And reward being that is a it's a very positive feeling. You want more of that. You want to move toward whatever that situation or that person is. There are a lot of benefits of being in reward state. So people in reward state think more clearly, have better access to long-term memory. They're more creative. You can see all the all the things there that are um, absolutely things that we want to be able to do on a daily basis, and especially in work, um, you know, bosses absolutely want their teams to be able to do this. So another study that was done um, was to measure the impact of a threat. And so what they did is they had three groups. Group one was in a room, and they had a picture of a mouse and a picture of cheese, and they had to move the mouse through the maze to the cheese. There's group two that did nothing, and then there's group three that had the mouse and the cheese, but the, an additional um, stimulus, which was an owl overhead. So even though uh, an owl is not a threat to us as humans, that third group that had that owl overhead, a picture of an owl, scored 50% lower on a creativity test following the task. 50% is huge impact for something that is seemingly no threat at all. So this just illustrates how tiny a threat can be to have a pretty substantial impact on performance. We tend to overemphasize threats. So if we can't quantify or qualify something as being a threat or reward, we believe that it's worse than it actually is. So for example, if I'm walking down the street at night by myself and there's someone walking towards me, I can't tell whether that person is, you know, good or bad um, or something. So I tend to prepare myself for the worst. I believe something bad might happen, right? Or I hear a rustle in the bushes and, you, and you, it startles you. You think that, that, you know, something giant is in there and it's probably a bird or something like that, right? So we tend to overemphasize this. We make mountains out of molehills. Um, this is the impact of not giving people all of the information. So in a change in an organization, when people don't have all the information, they tend to fill in the blanks themselves, and, ten and it tends to be with, with uh, theories or with beliefs that are far worse than the actual reality is. Our response to threat is five times greater than our response to reward. We feel it fast, and we go down really, really quickly, and we stay there for a long time. It takes a little while and sometimes a long time to come back out to kind of a state of homeostasis. Part of the reason of this is because there's five times more brain real estate given to threat than there is reward. Um, our brain's default response is threat. The more you're in threat, you literally start to atrophy your hippocampus, which impacts your memory long-term. Now, this would take a very sustained, long-term, long period of time um, in threat in order to start atrophying. But if you have, let's say, a long-term anxiety or long-term um, depression or something like that, this is the impact 
that it's having on, on your brain. The only time where threat is actually positive that we've seen is in professional athletes. Professional athletes actually tend to improve their motor functioning when they're in threat. Brain craving. So how do we how do we minimize the amount of threat and increase the amount of reward people are feeling so that we can keep them in that state where they're thinking creatively and solving those complex problems? So basically, we're quieting the amygdala and we're opening up access to the prefrontal cortex, right? So this is where SCARF comes in. It's in this, the acronym SCARF. There's five cravings of our brain. The first is status. Status is your relative importance to others. It's where you are in relation to other people. It's a perceived sense of status. When your perceived status goes up, your brain activates its reward circuitry. And higher status people, perceived status, again, live longer. So in fact, they, um, there was a study done to, to, to show if you live on the largest house in your block and you take that house and you lift it up and move it to another block, same exact house. Nothing else has changed except it's no longer the largest house on the block. Now it's the smallest house on the block. You actually will die earlier than you would have if you stayed in the largest house on the block. This your perceived sense of status dropped. C is certainty. Our brains are prediction machines. We like to know what's going to happen. Uncertainty arouses your limbic system, which again shuts down your prefrontal cortex. People don't seek out ambiguity. There are people who are better at navigating through it than others, but we don't crave more and more ambiguity. We don't ever go to work hoping that we know less about our future and less about the projects that we're working on, right? We crave certainty. A is autonomy. Autonomy is the feeling of having a choice, regardless of whether you actually have one. This dramatically reduces your stress levels. So it's not my way or the highway that someone else is telling you that. It's having this option. Autonomy is made up of choice, control, and options. However, remember that if you are giving someone options, make sure you're not personally tied to one of them because then you're not really giving options. Relatedness. Relatedness is friend or foe, trust or distrust, connect or don't connect. And foe is your default until proven up. And then fairness. Fairness is that you're treated like everyone. Something that you know when you see it or feel it. For example, if you have a high performer who's up the work of a low performer, that might feel unfair to the low performer or to the high performer because they're picking up the work for someone else. So if I tell someone on my team that I have feedback for them and I want to give them that feedback next Tuesday at 2 and to meet me in my office, what I've just done with something very, very small, a very small statement that is said probably numerous times in offices across the world, is I just compromised every status craving that that employee has. So I raised my status and lowered theirs by saying, by saying I'm going to give you the feedback. I gave that person no sense of certainty of what's going to happen next Tuesday at 2, if they're even going to have a job next Tuesday at 2. I didn't ask them if they were interested in feedback. I, they're now questioning the relationship that they thought we had together, and it feels like I'm treating them differently. It feels unfair the way that I've approached the situation. So what I've just done is I can guarantee that between now and next Tuesday at 2, that person will not be performing as effectively or as creatively or solving as complex problems as they normally would because they're in a state of threat consumed by what's going to happen next Tuesday at 2 between now and then. When a leader shows an interest in someone, supports them, praises them genuinely, serotonin is released. This leads to an individual opening their mind to ideas and creating a desire to really support that leader. 
On the other hand, if a leader diminishes an individual, maybe they say something in front of people or even even one on one, they make you feel like you the work you're not doing is valuable, right? Cortisol is released. This in, when this happens, individuals' brains shut down and they close off to new ideas and a willingness to help. So there's actually biological things that are happening in your brain that are causing these types of responses. There's also a multiplier effect on the number of scar scarf elements that you give or don't give. So you can consider if you have all five of those cravings that maybe you're super scarfed. Um, one uh, thing that I'll point out is that there is an online assessment that you can take. It's a very short, short assessment, and despite the name, it's not a 360 assessment, um, but it's called scarf360.com. If you go to that website, you can take a very short assessment, and it will tell you the order in which um, these scarf elements apply to you. So everyone has these five cravings, but you might have them in different degrees. Um, so one example of that is that for my team, I, um, I, I, I lead my team in the same way that I want to be led. So for me, my very, my very top brain craving is autonomy. And so what I like is someone very hands-off, just lets me run, lets me do whatever I want. All, you know, when there's an issue, you can talk to me. Otherwise, just, just I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm pointed in the right direction. I'm good, right? Um, and I, I need very little touch base and, and follow-up. So I was leading my team as if autonomy was their number one. So after I had them take the SCARF 360 assessment, what, we, what I learned is that certainty was the number one for almost all of them. And what that told me is that I was leading them based on my own SCARF needs and not what their SCARF needs were. And so they actually needed more from me, and I was giving them less because that's what I needed. So it's very important that you're aware of what your kind of order is and the, the order of others so that you're really getting after their needs and not your own. So what does this mean for your workforce? Going back to um, the very beginning, I was telling you that we're processing 10,000 sensory inputs at any given time. So all of these things are happening in meetings, when people are trying to get work done, on conference calls, all those kinds of things, there's a lot of other things on their mind that their brain's processing. This has huge implications in the workforce. In fact, your employees average five hours of solid thinking per week. Five hours. That's an incredible, incredibly small number, right? We think we're paid, you're paid for 40 hours. So five hours is all, you, is all you're getting. Now, this is solid thinking. Now, those five hours also are not necessarily consecutive five hours. 51% of employees do their best thinking somewhere other than at the office. So this is a really a case for um, alter alternative workplaces where people work at home or have flexible schedules or all those kinds of things. So n not everyone comes into the office and all of a sudden they're at their, they're at their absolute best in fact, a lot of people will say they, they think they're best maybe in the shower or in the car or something like that. So one thing that's important is to, as I mentioned before, inhibit distractions before they even take on momentum. So 75% of our distractions are unfulfilled intentions. What that means is like, I'm not worried about the toothpaste that I bought yesterday. I'm worried about the one or I'm thinking about the one that I need to remember to pick up on my way home today. So this is, this is called the Zargonic effect. We remember better that which is incomplete. The things that you have to remember to do, the incomplete activities, right, unfulfilled intentions. So finding a system to clear your mind of these unfulfilled intentions reduces the likelihood of internal distractions and unwelcome distractions. So writing those things down, keeping a list of all the to-dos. If you get it out and have it jotted down somewhere, then you're freeing up mind space to have to continuously remember it. Attention is a very, very limited resource, even though we treat it as if, it's, uh, as if we can access it at any time. 
If you can hold your attention for more than 10 seconds, you're doing a really, really good job. That means 10 seconds without any other thought coming into your head. Remember I was telling you about these, we don't have a lot of control over what comes into our consciousness. So if you can hold your attention on something with no other thought coming into your head for 10 seconds, it's pretty incredible. Thinking and attention uses working memory, which requires the use of our PFC, our prefrontal cortex, which again, remember, is an energy hog. It also likes serial things, and it's very small compared to the rest of the brain. We go through most of our life on automatic, right? We use our basal ganglia for that, a part of our brain. And so what we need to do is move information from our hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, into our basal ganglia, where we can use that information without having to recall it. We just operate on memory, or we operate on um, automatic. So the idea is that when you learn something, you have to use it or you lose it. Plus, you need sleep. So there's a whole other topic on the importance of sleep and how we learn, um, which we can you know, get into an, a, at a different time. But this is um, very, very, very interesting um, research. Our brain actually shuts off after a certain amount of time. There's a limit to the amount that can be digested. So when you're learning something new, after 20 minutes, your brain says, enough. Enough, I can't actually take in and process anymore at this time. So those of you who are cramming at the last minute for five hours for tests, it's a very ineffective approach for, for that reason. We can only learn something in 20-minute chunks. So learn for 20 minutes and then go do something. Tell someone about it. Walk. You know, do something like that. Learn for another 20 minutes. During breaks in learning, you need to do something with it and break learning into those bite-sized chunks. Focused attention actually changes our brain. So this is the, uh, like the cocktail party phenomenon where you're constantly scanning the environment for something more deserving of your attention. You're not necessarily aware of it, but it's certainly a distraction and it can inappropriately hijack your attention. So if you're paying attention, you actually understand what someone's saying about 50% of the time. And that's when you're paying attention. So a lot of times things are lost in translation. So you think that you understand where they're going with that statement or what they're trying to say. But in fact, you're missing all the cues because you're already filling in the blanks for them. You're already filling in. You're like, yep, 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 I got it, I got it. But you might miss something really small that ends up being a big detail. One of the reasons for this is that a lot of times we use hearing and listening as synonyms, and they're not synonyms. Hearing is physiological. You have the ability to hear. Listening is a behavior. We choose to, to do that. We choose to listen. But there aren't really classes in high school and grammar school and college on listening, even though it's a behavior that's learned. And in fact, listening, a lot of times people will say, well, eye contact, body language, these are all the, the cues to know that, in, it, that someone's listening to you or that you're listening to someone. In fact, eye contact is probably the number one way um, to know that. But, but when you break that down, it, it, it's really not true. Uh, when someone starts asking questions about what you were talking about on your agenda, that's the best way to know that that person's listening to you. They heard you. And they're, clarif they're, they're asking questions about it. So 6,000 employees were asked about when they do their best thinking. Only 10% said they do their best thinking at work. 39% said they do their best thinking at home, which means 51%, which I told you before, was they do their best thinking somewhere else. So maybe driving, maybe at the gym, maybe in the shower, but somewhere else. But the more startling is the 10%. 10% do their best thinking at work. 10%. That's incredible. Incredibly small. So 10% do their best thinking at work with five optimal hours per week. This is really interesting research that we need to be paying attention to in the field of OD and leadership development and management and HR. 59% of people said, I do my best thinking in the morning. 
specifically Monday through Wednesday mornings. So this is really interesting because if you think about this, think about that in the judicial system. So the fairness of a trial could depend on people when people are doing their best thinking. When do you want someone operating on you? When do you want someone making a decision on life or death, you know, in a in a in a trial? All these attention rich tasks that are important to have a fresh and alert mind really depend on where and when you do your best thinking. So we talked about how there's five optimal hours per week. Your brain interacts with information versus stores information by creating visuals for complex ideas. So, so it's much better if you create these visual pictures of complex ideas instead of listing out projects. If we can simplify things to their salient features, really small chunks and the important essence of something, then we're, we can free ourselves up to really reflect on this, these problems at a very high level. So if you take a really complex problem and break it down into just the essence, put it into chunks, focus on the most important parts of it, and then focus on the connections between them, rather than drilling so deep into problems. So sometimes we'll sit in front of a problem and we'll stare at it and we'll stare at it, we'll get more data and more data, and we get down to where we're kind of in analysis paralysis, where if we just back up and look at the essence of it and chunk it out, we can start seeing the connections between things and solving problems on a different level. Again, this happens, though, during these five hours where we're able to really do this. It's important for you to identify when are those hours for you? When are you most effective and most creative? So what do you know now that you didn't know 40 minutes ago? The definition of neural leadership. So this is the um, coming together of the field of neuroscience and the field of leadership, that our brain is organized by threat and reward, and that we have five brain cravings in the acronym of SCARF. Attention is an extremely limited resource, and optimal thinking time is a premium for us. In part two, we're going to talk about all of this and the implication for leaders how this impacts senior leaders and what's different about the senior leader brain. How important is sleep? How do you integrate a lot of this stuff into your organization and change management and onboarding and all those types of things? What are examples of that? And what I wanted to do is make sure that there was time for questions. So I'll take those um, at any time. Uh, thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, we actually don't have any entries in the Q&A box. Uh, I'll leave just a minute. Uh, if anyone has any questions or wants clarification on anything that uh, Dr. McCusker touched on in this presentation, and likewise, uh, if there are people who did not get a chance to attend live but oh, who are listening to this recording, uh, if you have any questions, those can go to either myself. Uh, I'll reiterate my email in just a moment. Uh, or you can send it to the UCI box, or Dr. McCusker has her uh, Oakley email address up on the screen right now. Uh, okay, I do have a question from Joe. Uh, yes, I will be sending out a link to this recording. It usually takes iTech, uh, I'm sorry, WebEx, uh, about uh, 24 hours or so to process it, uh, and that way you can watch it again and again. I know I will be. <laughs> be riveted all over again. Exactly. Okay, well, again, if anybody has any follow-up questions, uh, you can definitely send those our way. I want to thank you again for, for attending today, and thank you very much to uh, Dr. McCusker for that information. Once again, my mind is blown, and uh, I'll be looking forward to part two. And speaking of part two, uh, there will be uh, a link to part two probably when I send out that email uh, tomorrow that has the recording. Everyone who signed up will get that link uh, to sign up for part two. Um, and a uh, follow-up question. Uh, there's a question, Jennifer, about uh, access to the raw research data. Could you yeah, yeah. Uh, point them in the right direction to that? Yeah, the, the absolute best place to go, uh, thank you for the question, is neuroleadership.org. Uh, 
on that website, you'll have links to research and um, the actual neuroscientists and all of that kind of stuff. So um, this particular research on SCARF comes from David Rock's work. And if you actually Google David Rock, not only is he, um, you can absolutely find him on neuroleadership.org as he's one of the founders of the Neuroleadership Institute, uh, but he's also got his own sites. And the book that most of this is in is Your Brain at Work. Um, again, this is one tiny slice of data and research from a huge emerging field um, that's covering lots of areas. But the stuff that I was talking about today, a lot of that uh, would, is in his book. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so David Rock, Google that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it was neuroleadership.org? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, just to reiterate my contact information, you'll see my email on the screen right there. Uh, if you do have any other questions that you think of later when you're watching this again, uh, please send those my way. We'll get those answered for you. Uh, if you have any other questions about uh, UC Irvine programs or the Human Resources program or the Business Admin program, uh, please feel free to send those my way. Also, my director's contact information is on the screen along with our address if you want to mail us something for any reason. Uh, otherwise, check it out uh, on the website. I hope you did see some classes or topics that piqued your interest and maybe you'll consider joining our program. So uh, again, thank you very much uh, to Jennifer McCusker for presenting today. Perfect. Thank you for having and, me. And again, I'll be sending out the recording to everyone uh, along with a link to sign up for part two. Uh, so thanks again to everyone who attended and have a great day. Take care.